All right, ladies and gentlemen, excited for this next debate, in particular, whether or not Muhammad's marriage to Aisha was immoral. Thanks so much for being with us. We're going to jump right into this one because we want to keep up on our schedule. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Amy, who will be reading the format for this debate, as well as getting our speakers started. Thanks so much. Thank you so very much, James. Tonight's format is going to be 22-minute openings with 10-minute rebuttals back and forth, about a 15-minute dialogue or conversation, and then four-minute closing statements that end with a 15-minute audience Q&A. And with that, I'm going to hand it over to Dr. David Wood for their opening statement. Thank you, James and Amy, and special, and special thanks, thanks to Kenny you. for suggesting this topic. This isn't the sort of topic I would expect a Muslim debater to suggest, so I have to say I am impressed. Uh, before we get started, are there any jihadis in the house tonight? <laughs> I, gave my I gave my location. Anyone want to take out the dizzle before I start talking about Muhammad? No? Not for a lot. Don't say I didn't give you the opportunity, Yucky. Our topic is, was Muhammad's marriage to Aisha immoral? Now, if you're not familiar with this issue, you may be wondering, why would a marriage be immoral? And the answer is because when they were married, Muhammad was 51 years old and Aisha was six years old. So the real question we're asking is whether it's immoral for a tiny little girl to be married off to a man who's old enough to be her great-great-great-great-great-great-great-grandfather. I know I just exaggerated a bit, but if I've learned anything from my Muslim friends, it's that we should always exaggerate how great Muhammad was. <laughs> to be fair, Muhammad's marriage to Aisha wasn't consummated until three years after they were married. So Muhammad had sex with Aisha when he was 54 years old and she was nine years old. Was that immoral? Keep in mind, we're not talking about just any man. We're not asking whether some random old creepy guy's marriage to a nine-year-old girl was immoral. According to the Quran, Surah 33, verse 21, Muhammad is the pattern of conduct for Muslims. He's the pattern of conduct for billions of people down through history. So the heart of the issue is this. Is it immoral for a man who's the pattern of conduct for billions of people to marry a girl who's young enough to be his granddaughter and to have sex with her when she's only nine years old? I say, yes, it is immoral. It's shockingly immoral. It's really, 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 really immoral. The religion of Islam says, no, you're wrong, David. It's not immoral at all. Not only is it perfectly acceptable, it's an act fit for Islam's ideal pattern of conduct. And only a racist, Islamophobic, hate-mongering bigot would have any problem with Muhammad's marriage to a child. Sheikh Yusuf Estes, one of the most popular Muslim speakers in the world, compares Muhammad and Aisha to Romeo and Juliet. Somehow, I don't think that Romeo and Juliet would have, been, would have enjoyed such lasting popularity if Romeo had been 51 and Juliet had been six. Now, why do I say that it's immoral for a man in his 50s to marry and have sex with a little girl whose age is still in single digits, especially when that man in his 50s is the one who defines morality for billions of followers? The obvious reason is that having sex with a child is disgusting and perverted, but this is a debate, so I can't just say that it's disgusting and perverted. I need to prove my case. Fortunately, I have a quotation from someone whose words will be accepted even by my opponent. Even Kenny will have to agree with this. Here's a quote from an expert in religious matters after the expert was asked about sex with nine-year-old girls. He said, I don't know about you, but let's be honest with it. I'm a 50-year-old man, and I've seen women that are far more attractive than nine-year-old girls. They're far more developed. I'm just trying to put things in perspective. A nine-year-old girl versus a woman. Men like women. There's perverts out there, but usually those people have issues with their lack of performance or impotence or things of that nature. So those are perverts. Those are people who have issues. So according to this expert, grown men are attracted to grown women. A grown man who's attracted to a nine-year-old girl is a pervert, someone who has issues. I said that even my opponent will have to agree with these words because these words were spoken by Kenny. 
Now, I could have just stated what our topic was, then pointed out that Muhammad had sex with a nine-year-old girl, then quoted Kenny saying that grown men who are attracted to little girls are perverts, and then rested my airtight case. The debate would have been over. But after Kenny said that grown men who are attracted to nine-year-old girls are perverts, he went on to say, but that has nothing to do with Islam. Nothing to do with Islam. The man that your God describes as your pattern of conduct had sex with a nine-year-old girl. How can that have nothing to do with men having sex with nine-year-old girls? How can Muslims insist that there's no problem here? How can Muslims reconcile the Quran's claim that Muhammad is a wonderful pattern of conduct with the historical fact that Muhammad climbed on top of a nine-year-old girl when he was more than 50 years old? Well, there are three basic approaches that Muslims take. First, it's become quite common in recent years for Muslims to assert that Aisha was much older than nine when her prophet had sex with her. They say that Aisha was 16 or 18 or maybe even older when her pattern of conduct penetrated her. Unfortunately for proponents of the Aisha was much older defense, this response only works in an atmosphere of total ignorance. If someone who's never read the Muslim sources hears that Aisha was much older than nine, he might believe it. But as soon as you start reading Islam's most trusted sources, you find hadith after hadith after hadith saying that Aisha was nine years old when Muhammad had sex with her. You never find any of these sources saying that she was 16 or 18 or older. The only disagreement you find in these sources is whether she was six or seven when the marriage contract was written. Islam's most trusted sources agree that she was nine years old when the marriage was consummated. Let's read a few examples. Sahih al-Bukhari, 5158, narrated Urwa, the prophet wrote the marriage contract with Aisha while she was six years old and consummated his marriage with her while she was nine years old, and she remained with him for nine years, i.e. till his death. See also Sahih al-Bukhari, 3894, 3896, 5133, and 5134, which all agree that Aisha was nine years old when Muhammad had sex with her. Sahih Muslim, 3311. Aisha reported that Allah's apostle married her when she was seven years old, and she was taken to his house as a bride when she was nine, and her dolls were with her. And when he died, she was 18 years old. See also Sahih Muslim 3309 and 3310, which agree that Aisha was nine years old when Muhammad had sex with her. Sunan Abu Dawud 2116 narrated Aisha, the messenger of Allah married me when I was seven years old or six years old. He had intercourse with me when I was nine years old. See also Sunan Abu Dawud 4915, 4916, 4917, and 4918, which all agree that Aisha was, you guessed it, nine years old when Muhammad had sex with her. Sunan An-Nasai 3380, it was narrated that Aisha said, the messenger of Allah married me when I was six and consummated the marriage with me when I was nine, and I used to play with dolls. See also Sunan An-Nasai 3257, 3258, 3259, 3260, and 3381, which all agree that Aisha was, once again, nine years old when Muhammad had sex with her. Now, we could continue by going through Sunan Ibn Majah, the history about Tabari, and so on, which all agree that Aisha was nine years old when Muhammad had sex with her. But instead of continuing with even more sources that say that Aisha was nine years old when Muhammad had sex with her, Let's take the time to go through all the Muslim sources that say that Aisha was 16 or 18 or older when Muhammad had sex with her. And we're done, because there are none. We can sum up the testimony of the Hadith and Sirah literature with a quote from Ibn Kathir, one of the most respected Islamic scholars of all time. In his four-volume biography of Muhammad, Ibn Kathir quotes Urwa ibn al-Zubair, Aisha's nephew, who says that Aisha was nine years old when Muhammad consummated his marriage with her. Then, after quoting Urwa on the age of Aisha, Ibn Kathir says this. His statement, he contracted marriage with Aisha when she was six, thereafter consummating with her when she was nine, is not disputed by anyone and is well established in the Sahih collections of traditions and elsewhere. When scholars disagreed on an issue, Ibn Kathir would draw attention to the disagreement. But when it comes to Muhammad having sex with Aisha when she was nine years old, Ibn Kathir says that it's not disputed by anyone. Ibn Kathir would roll over in his grave if he heard modern Muslim scholars and apologists saying that Aisha was 16 or 18, all to make Muslims feel better about their prophet. 
I think our Muslim friends should take the advice of Sheikh Yasser Qadi, who rebuked Muslims who lie about the age of Aisha. He said, O oh Muslims, don't apologize for the truth and don't distort the truth. There are Muslims that try to deny this. Oh, he didn't marry Aisha as a young girl. Yaqi, look, it's not the way forward. We don't lie for the sake of our religion. Astaghfirullah. We have the truth. We're not going to cover up the truth if people find it embarrassing. This is the reality. Deal with it. Our prophet married a young girl, and it was fine for the time. How old was she? Nine years old. Anyone who says otherwise is either ignorant or deceptive. Second, since the Aisha was much older defense is doomed to failure, other Muslim apologists acknowledge that Aisha was nine years old, while insisting that she was an early bloomer and had reached puberty and was already very mature when Muhammad took her to his bed. <clears throat> this is the defense of people like Ali Dawa, who was caught on video saying that if his daughter started menstruating at the age of nine, he would tell her that she's ready to get married. We'll call this the old enough to bleed, old enough to breed defense. There are three main problems with the old enough to bleed, old enough to breed defense. One, getting your first period doesn't mean your body is ready to start having kids. Two, Aisha hadn't reached puberty when Muhammad had sex with her. And three, the Quran allows men to have sex with girls even before they've reached puberty. Let's go through these. Does a girl getting her first period mean that she's ready to start having kids? No. Puberty is a process that takes time. It takes time for a girl's hips to widen. It takes time for a girl's birth canal to widen. It takes time for a girl's breasts to develop. It takes time for a girl to grow from a child into an adult. When a man gets a young girl pregnant, he's putting both the girl and her baby at risk. Rates of toxemia, sepsis, obstructed and prolonged labor, hemorrhaging, and fistulas all increase significantly for very young mothers. The babies born to these young mothers have higher rates of infant mortality, premature birth, and low birth weight. What's the solution? It's simple. Don't have sex with a girl until she becomes a fully grown woman. And yet we find popular Muslim apologists promoting child marriage even for their own daughters. Why? because obstetricians think it's a good idea? No, because their prophet married a child. So just because a girl reaches puberty doesn't mean a grown man should pounce on her. But had Aisha actually reached puberty when Muhammad had sex with her? No, she hadn't. The English translation of Sahih al-Bukhari includes some parenthetical commentary from Ibn Hajar al-Asqalani Listen to Sahih al Bukhari 6130. Narrated Aisha, I used to play with dolls in the presence of the Prophet, and my girlfriends also used to play with me. When Allah's Messenger used to enter my dwelling place, they used to hide themselves, but the Prophet would call them to join and play with me. Playing with dolls and similar images is forbidden. But it was allowed for Aisha at that time, as she was a little girl, not yet reached the age of puberty. Did you catch that? Not only did Muhammad like to watch his child bride Aisha play with her little friends, he also liked to watch her play with dolls. But dolls are considered images in Islam, and images are forbidden. So why was Aisha allowed to play with dolls in the presence of Muhammad? The passage tells us she was a little girl who hadn't reached the age of puberty. Images were forbidden, but since prepubescent girls hadn't reached the age of moral accountability, the rule didn't apply to them. With this in mind, listen once again to Sahih Muslim 3311, which we read earlier. Aisha reported, that Aisha, uh, Aisha reported that Allah's apostle married her when she was seven years old, and she was taken to his house as a bride when she was nine, and her dolls were with her. And when he died, she was 18 years old. She was still playing with dolls when she was taken to Muhammad's house so that he could consummate the marriage. But only prepubescent girls were allowed to play with dolls. Yes, the prophet of Islam, Islam's pattern of conduct, had sex with a prepubescent girl. And why wouldn't he? Since the Quran itself allows men to have sex with prepubescent girls. According to the Quran, a Muslim man can marry, have sex with, and divorce a girl all before she's reached puberty. 
In Surah 65, verse 4 of the Quran, Allah gives rules for divorcing women and girls who don't have a monthly menstrual cycle. Earlier in the Quran, Allah had declared that if a man divorces a woman, there's a waiting period before the, women, the woman can get married again. The waiting period was three monthly menstrual cycles. The idea was that there should be a waiting period in between husbands so that if the woman had a child, there wouldn't be any confusion as to who the father was. But Muhammad's followers eventually asked him, what about women and girls who don't have a monthly menstrual cycle, either because they're too old or because they're too young or because they're pregnant? And Allah says in Surah 65, verse 4 of the Quran, that if a man divorces a girl who's too young for a monthly menstrual cycle because she hasn't reached puberty, the girl has to wait three months before she marries another man, not three menstrual cycles. The girl doesn't have a menstrual cycle yet. She waits three months instead. So according to the Quran, a man can marry a prepubescent girl, then have sex with her, then divorce her, then pass her on to the next man who can marry her, have sex with her, and divorce her all before the girl has ever reached puberty. If you think I'm wrong about what Surah 65 verse 4 of the Quran is saying, by all means read the commentaries. Read Ibn Abbas, read Ibn Kathir, read Tafsir Jalalain, read modern commentators like Maududi. Even popular Muslim speakers like Muhammad Hijab admit what this verse is saying. Muhammad Hijab says that if we didn't have the hadith, if we didn't, have, if we didn't know from the hadith that Muhammad waited until Aisha was nine, year old, nine years old to have sex with her, if all we had to go on was the Quran, we would assume that men can have sex with five-year-old girls. Because Surah 65, verse 4, allows sex with prepubescent girls. So the Quran allows sex with prepubescent girls, and Muhammad had sex with a prepubescent girl. This means that as reprehensible as people like Ali Dawa are when they present the old enough to bleed, old enough to breed defense, Muhammad and the Quran are actually much worse. As disgusting as it was to hear Ali Dawa say that if his daughter started menstruating at nine years old, he would tell her that she's ready for marriage, Muhammad and the Quran are worse because they say, why wait till she starts menstruating? That leaves us with the third Muslim defense, which is to admit that Aisha was only nine years old when Muhammad climbed on top of her, and to admit that she hadn't reached puberty, but to maintain that there's nothing wrong with a grown man having sex with a prepubescent nine-year-old girl. That is the true position of Islam, and it's the only defense that's consistent with Allah's commands in the Quran and Muhammad's example in the Hadith. The position of the Quran and the Hadith and of Muslim scholars and apologists who are honest about their religion is that there's simply nothing wrong with a grown man having sex with a prepubescent girl. But these Muslim scholars and apologists know how strange this sounds to non-Muslims, so they offer various additional defenses. They'll say that Muhammad married Aisha because he was trying to solidify his relationship with her father, Abu Bakr. And this is just silly. One, Abu Bakr was already Muhammad's most faithful companion. Marrying his prepubescent daughter wouldn't help that in any way. Two, Abu Bakr had an older daughter, Asma. Muhammad had simply wanted to create some family ties. He could have married the older daughter who had already reached puberty. Three, if you read the sources, you'll see that Muhammad had to actually weaken his relationship with Abu Bakr. Muhammad proposed the marriage and Abu Bakr objected. He said, but we're brothers. In other words, we're so close that marrying Aisha would be like marrying your own niece. And Muhammad replied, we're only brothers in religion. Aisha is lawful for me. Far from showing Abu Bakr how close they were, Muhammad's marriage to Aisha pushed Abu Bakr further away. Not a good defense. Next, Muslim scholars and apologists claim that Muhammad had to marry Aisha because he needed someone who would pass on important stories about him. Aisha passed on lots of stories about Muhammad. She had a good memory. Maybe that's why Allah told Muhammad to marry her. So according to this claim, the best way that the creator of the universe could ensure that future generations would know as much as possible, as much as possible about Muhammad was to have Muhammad marry and have sex with a little girl. Now, since I can come up with way better ways to preserve information about Muhammad off the top of my head, I'm pretty sure the creator of the universe could come up with a better plan, one that didn't involve so much suffering for future generations of little girls. Next, Muslim scholars and apologists commit what's called the two quoque fallacy, but they have to combine this fallacy with some outright lying. You commit the two quoque fallacy when instead of actually answering a criticism, you point a finger at the person who's presenting the criticism and say, but you've got the same problem too. It's a fallacy because even if the person has the same problem, this doesn't mean that there's no problem. 
It would only mean that you both have the same problem. Very common fallacy. So in order to deflect criticism against Muhammad for marrying a child, Muslim scholars and apologists will claim that Christians have the same problem. But which pattern of conduct in the Bible had sex with a nine-year-old girl? None. This is where lying comes in. They go to people in the Bible whose ages aren't mentioned and just claim that they were super young. They'll make up ages and sometimes they'll be extremely deceptive when they do it. So it's a fallacy combined with deception. These Muslim scholars and apologists are basically saying, if you tell the truth about Muhammad, we'll lie about people in the Bible. Interesting tactic. Next, Muslim scholars and apologists commit the argumentum ad populum fallacy, which is also called the bandwagon fallacy. If you've ever caught your kids doing something they're not supposed to be doing, you've heard the bandwagon fallacy. But everyone's doing it. So Muslims will defend Muhammad by saying that lots of people down through history married young girls. This is another strange response because morality in Islam isn't decided by popular vote. Islam condemns drinking alcohol. If someone replies, well, lots of people down through history drank alcohol, so it can't be wrong. Will Muslims accept this as a refutation? Of course not, so why use the bandwagon fallacy here? Finally, if nothing else works, Muslim scholars and apologists will commit the ad hominem fallacy. If you say that it's wrong for a grown man to have sex with a little girl, they'll just call you an Islamophobe, as if the only reason anyone could ever object to a grown man having sex with a little girl is some irrational fear of Islam. This is always a good time to remember the Andrew Cummins definition of Islamophobia. Andrew said, Islamophobia is a word created by fascists and used by cowards to manipulate morons. Sorry, Muslim scholars and apologists of the world, but you're not going to convince us that having sex with children is okay by calling us names. So, was Muhammad's marriage to Aisha immoral? Is it immoral for a man who's the pattern of conduct for billions of people to marry a girl who's young enough to be his granddaughter and to have sex with her when she's only nine years old? I obviously think it's immoral, and I'm sure most of you do as well, but maybe we're wrong. Maybe we're, maybe we're wrong and it's okay after all. Maybe Kenny can show us that we've made a mistake. It'll be a terrifying day for the young girls of the world if Kenny makes a good case here, but let's hear him out anyway. Thank you so very much, Dr. Wood, for your opening statement. And with that, we are going to hand it over to Kenny for your up to 22 minute opening statement. Thank you. So, I want to start by saying Assalamu alaikum, Ramatullahi wa barakatuh. I appreciate uh, the organizers being so hospitable. They've done a great job with the uh, DebateCon 2022, so I look forward to, to more uh, in the future. So, uh, before we get started, what I want to do, I would like to uh, gift David Wood with a copy of a book titled American Child Bride, A History of Minors and Marriage in the United States, as well as give him a copy of my, my book, Consider Islam. I'll have to get a, that's an author copy, but I'll, I'll get that for you here shortly. Uh, Sheikh Uthman Ibn Farouk, he said that you had a, a reading assignment and some homework to do, so maybe you can add that to your, 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 uh, your list of stuff to study. And so let's get started with this. And let me start my time. And as we get started, I'd, I'd like to ask the, the, the audience and viewers to approach what I have to say as if you've walked into a courtroom of logic and reason. You know, I ask you to, to clear your minds, think for yourselves, and to consider that you often find out more about the accuser than the one being accused if you're willing to open yourself up and listen. David Wood is misleading people on this topic by engaging in what's called presentism and ethnocentrism and by attempting to misalign facts. He's only giving you part of the story that he wants you to hear. So in an article titled, Don't Judge Our Ancestors' Actions by Today's Standards by Chip Hughes, he, he defines presentism. He says that it's a historical term meaning judging past actions by today's standards or uncritical adherence to present day attitudes, especially the tendency to interpret past events in terms of modern values and concepts. And he says we all too often color history in the, with the lens of our own current prejudices. The historian David Hackett Fisher uh, in his book, Historian's Fallacies, he says, Presentism is a logical fallacy in that people should at least try to be aware of their biases and view history in such a way that they do not create a distorted depiction of the past. Against presentism by Lynn Hunt, she says, presentism at its worst encourages a kind of moral complacency and a self-congratulation. Interpreting the past in terms of present day concerns usually leads us to think of ourselves as morally superior. 
and it leads into ethnocentrism, which is a belief that, uh, that one's own culture is superior to others by judging the attributes of another culture, uh, often in disparaging terms. She says that the term, uh, excuse me, the term is, was invented in 1906, rather, by sociologist William Sumner, who conceptualized it as a, a means of promoting solidarity within the so-called in-group by antagonizing the so-called out-group. And we certainly know that we can hear today uh, David Wood is certainly guilty of antagonizing Muslims, and by demonizing the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, what he's attempting to do, inevitably, he's trying to demonize all Muslims. So what, what, what accusation is being made? Obviously, you've heard it. He's accusing the Prophet of being a pedophile, a stuck for law. That's far from the truth. So during this debate, I will not be attempting to prove or disprove any hadith uh, about Aisha's age, or I'm not trying to prove or disprove any scholar. This debate is not about the reliability of hadith, and I do not necessarily agree nor disagree with any Muslim or non-Muslim scholar that I mentioned. My point is that they, there are different theories about the age of Aisha uh, when the marriage is consummated, and so because there's disagreement, there's therefore reason for doubt Aisha's age. However, what these Muslim and non-Muslim scholars do agree about is that there was absolutely no wrongdoing on the part of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So let's be clear again, I'm not here to debate hadith and what this scholar said versus that scholar. That's not what we're looking at. I'm arguing to establish reasonable doubt in this modern day. So for 14, 15 years or so, David Wood has been accusing the Prophet, peace be upon him, of being a pedophile by looking through a very narrow-minded and bigoted modern day lens while accusing the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam of something that he'll never be able to prove him guilty of. So let's throw out the hypocrisy along with the baby Aisha idea and all the bathwater and all that nonsense and let's demand consistency. In modern times, courts do not convict people based on hearsay. Hearsay automatically brings about reasonable doubt in the minds of honest and reasonable people. And in modern times, people are considered innocent until proven guilty. If people in modern times are going to accuse the prophet, peace be upon him, of immorality regarding the marriage, when in fact no one of his time made such accusations, I repeat, no one of his time made such accusations, it's hardest, his most fearsome enemies, they didn't accuse him of that, then let's be fair and consistent. In modern times, people are not found guilty uh, in, a, in a court of law unless the evidence is proved beyond a reasonable doubt, which is defined as the traditional standard of proof that must be exceeded to secure a guilty verdict in a criminal case of law. So this phrase, beyond a reasonable doubt, means that the evidence presented and the arguments put forward by the, the prosecution establish the defendant's guilt so clearly that it must be accepted as fact by any rational person. Of course, it's hard to be reasonable with you know, uh, irrational and unreasonable people. But what, ev what evidence is David Wood hiding? Let's talk about it. David Wood isn't telling you that Aisha was very happily married to the prophet, peace be upon him. And she was, uh, she was highly jealous of other wives. Now think about that. She was highly jealous of other wives. Does that sound like someone who's been abused? She never spoke about any type of abuse or unhappiness. She defended the prophet adamantly until the day that he died with his head in her lap. David Wood might find that to be some sexually, or sexually arousing, I don't know, but he died with his head in her lap, peace be upon him. She was a very well-educated scholar of Islam and who could have easily spoken about abuse if in fact there was any. If in fact there was any. She was a strong, triumphant Muslim woman who had the capacity of character and the means to lash out at anyone who might have abused her. She had ample opportunity after the prophet died, peace be upon him, but David, wants you to, David Wood wants you to envision her as a defenseless little child. Okay, well, she grew, and she, had, she was a woman that could have spoken up if she had been abused. We don't, we don't hear about that. David Wood is attempting to totally negate and dismiss various opinions by modern and contemporary scholars uh, and historians on this issue as if their opinions are somehow less valid than, you know, than, than those who hold the traditional view. David Wood wants you... Wants to, but, this is what it boils down. David Wood wants to decide the debate for the Muslims themselves by picking the side that best fits, yes, indeed, his Islamophobic agenda. And, uh, you know, what's his intention? To demonize the prophet and, again, thereby demonize all Muslims who want to emulate him. Peace be upon him. David Wood is inevitably attacking the character of all Muslims. And I'm not, I'm not, I'm not going to sit by and, and allow it. I'm not, I'm not going to put up with it. So we're going we're to end this t today, David. So as Muslims... We do indeed have the right to disagree, and in fact, uh, on this issue, there are valid reasons to disagree, and on this topic, uh, you know, it's, you know, th there's disagreement amongst Muslims. So Allah gives guidance in the Quran about coming to common terms when there's disagreement amongst people, and that Allah himself will eventually inform people about that which they used to differ on the Day of Judgment. The common terms amongst Muslims on this matter 
as well as many decent, unbiased, non-Muslim scholars and historians, is that there was absolutely no wrongdoing committed on, on the part of the Prophet uh, in regards to this marriage, peace be upon him. So that's what we should focus on, because that's where the consensus of agreement lies. David Wood, you know, uh, we don't try to tell you how to figure out how a father can be his own son and a son can be his own father. And you're not going to define for us, for the Muslims, which side of this issue that the Muslims debate is the correct one. You don't get, you don't get that opportunity. It's not going to happen. Okay, not, maybe in your world of Islamophobes in the puppet show you put on, but not over here. So, uh, you know, while it is true that many Muslim scholars have accepted the tradition that Aisha was nine years old when the marriage was consummated, others believe that she was older. And both sides have strong arguments based on various hadiths to, to justify their theories. The disagreement amongst Muslims and this ongoing debate proves Aisha's age cannot be confirmed either way. No, no crime can be proven without facts and people you know, honest people, sincere people, unbiased people consider all the facts. And, you know, speculation and theories and, you know, based on opinions, traditions, emotions, conjecture, none of that is, uh, does anything but generate reasonable doubt in the minds of reasonable people. So, please, be, excuse me, what it boils down to is no one knows for sure. No Muslim truly knows what her age was. No non-Muslim knows what her age was. Let's face it, we weren't there. Muslims, you weren't there. Uh, David Woods was, wasn't there. No one knows. New World Encyclopedia addresses this marriage. And let's say, think about what's being said. They have no reason to, you know, they're not Muslims, obviously. So they, they state, the age of Aisha at marriage is a, an extremely contentious one. The age of Aisha at marriage is an extremely contentious one. Contentious amongst whom? Muslims. The Muslims debate about it. On the other hand, they say, there are several hadiths. Uh, that which state that uh, that were narrated by Aisha herself, which claim that she was nine or six or seven years old, rather, when the, when uh, engaged and nine when the marriage was consummated. But they state, on the other hand, there's evidence from early Muslim chronicles like Ibn Ishaq uh, that indicates, and, and others, they say that uh, that Aisha uh, may have been 12 to 14 years old, just past the age of puberty, or perhaps even older. They say some Muslim scholars point to other traditions. They say that conflict with those attributed to uh, hadith narrated by Aisha on this matter. So let's look at some of those examples of these people. So proof that, in an article titled "Proof That Aisha Was 15 Years Old When the Marriage uh, when, when Married to the Prophet Peace Be Upon Him," published fe February 2019 by Dr. Uh, Sheikh Dr. Uh, Ridwan Ibn Salim, and he says, and I quote. Although the widely cited hadith states that Aisha was nine years old when, when her marriage to the Prophet, peace be upon him, was consummated, this is contradicted by strong historical evidence. Reports of Aisha's age and works by such authorities as Nawawi, Askalani, Ibn Kathir, all place her in, in her late teens at the time when the marriage was consummated. He has a footnote at the bottom of that uh, article, and he states, This article is not an apologetic response, but a sincerely held opinion after investigating the issue and ultimately he says, this is my opinion based on reading of historical evidence, and it's the job of the student of Islamic tradition to investigate to the best of his or her ability. So a non-Muslim, Leslie Hazelton, in her books, The First Muslim and After the Prophet, and I can give the page numbers if need be, but she says, Aisha maintained, this is a quote, Aisha maintained she was six years old when she was engaged and nine when the marriage was consummated and celebrate it. But more restrained reports have her age nine when she was betrothed and 12 when she was actually married, which makes sense, she says, since custom dictated that girls be married at puberty. Dr. Rezat Halemez in Fountain Magazine says, and I quote, she was at least 17 or 18 when she married the prophet of Medina. Jana Media Pro in the book, The Life of Aisha, Mother of Believers, page eight says, most likely, she was most likely 10 when engaged and wed uh, probably, probably probably around 14 or 15 when consummated. Uh, Muhammad, a short introduction by Dr. Uh, uh, Jonathan Brown on page 76, 77, says that she was between nine or 10 when consummated. The Life of Muhammad by Haikal, a book that I've had since the day I took Shahada almost 30 years ago, on page 139 says that she was 11 years old when the marriage was consummated. And in a recent article, uh, Aisha was 19, not nine, by Fazal Rahman, published December 28th, just last month, December uh, 2021, she, he says, and I quote, as all biographers of the prophet agree that he consummated his marriage with Aisha in the second year after Hijra, it can be conclusively said that she was 19 at the time and not nine as alleged in the aforementioned hadiths. And there are many other articles and books that I can mention. As a matter of fact, the reason I have these books on my table right here is because preparing for this debate, I've gone through all 10 of these books and all 10 of these books have a different age. 
I'm going to repeat. These are Muslim books, some Muslim and non-Muslim scholars, and they all have her at a different age. Does a reasonable-minded person draw a conclusion based on that type of evidence? What I've just read here? Absolutely not. If you're, if you're true to yourself, and you're a decent, unbiased person, you cannot convict someone of a crime based on all these, you, what, what, do you, what are you supposed to believe? There are many articles and books that I can mention. So what does a reasonable person do with you know, this conflicting evidence? Are these theories by these scholars and historians correct? Which ones are correct? Which ones are wrong? So consider this fact. When you compare the David Wood version of anything related to Islam with the opinions of non-Muslim scholars who have studied Islam and the life of the Prophet, peace be upon him, objectively, a whole different narrative about his life and, and the teachings of Islam come into focus. By example, in the book, What the Quran Meant, Why It Matters, I have it up here, as a matter of fact, by New York Times bestselling author Gary Wills, a non-Muslim, he addresses this marriage on page 189 of his book, and he says, and I quote, Aisha is reported to have been nine when Muhammad married her, which has led to a great deal of criticism of the prophet, but early marriages were common until recently, and no one knows when this one was consummated. That's non-Muslim, no, no dog in the fight. He says no one knows when the marriage was consummated. Gary Wills is saying that because there are differing opinions on the issue, even amongst classical Muslim scholars. There are people on both sides who have either attached their emotions, opinions, traditions, false accusations, like this man, uh, you know, to one side or another without looking at all the evidence unbiasedly. Instead, they engage in cherry picking information and confirmation, anchoring bias. And sometimes people don't realize that they're doing that, unfortunately, but uh, these are logical fallacies, fallacies and, uh, you know, while, uh, uh, other people have an agenda, and obviously David Woods is the type of person who has an agenda. But a person who looks at all this information about this topic, you know, uh, you know, and does not allow the opinions of other people to impede on their own logic and reason, can only include that, you know, based on all the evidence on this topic, no one knows for sure what, how old she was. And so... Uh, that's the facts. So when, you know, we can go back and forth between this hadith and that hadith and mention what this scholar says versus that scholar, or we can be honest and admit that the fact is there are no facts that can actually be truly established regarding her age because there's much agreement on, dis disagreement on the issue. The scholars disagree. The Muslim scholars themselves disagree. They have been debating the topic for decades. And so David Wood doesn't mention, uh, you know, that in Islamic law uh, on this issue that a person cannot marry under the fiqh. A person cannot marry until they've reached the age of puberty, but they also have to be mentally and emotionally ready. Okay? And so David Wood doesn't tell his followers, uh, you know, that even if the marriage was consummated at 9 or 10 years old, such practices were indeed common. He does, he's trying to belittle that, but that's a fact of the matter. He needs to read that book that I just gifted him during his homework session. And so consider this hypocrisy. It's utter hypocrisy. Uh, and again, you often find out more about the accuser than the one being accused. In an article called, uh, titled Age of Consent, a historical overview by Dr. Vern Bullo. Uh, Dr. Bullo says that age of consent throughout history is usually coincided with the age of puberty. Also, uh, although times it has been as early as seven, uh, seven years old. And, and uh, Dr. Bullo states that the Roman tradition served as the base for Christian Europe as well as the Christian church itself, which generally and essentially based on biological de development set the age at 12 or 14, but continued, he says, to set the absolute minimum at seven. And surely David Wood knows this, uh, uh, that as late as, as 9, 1965, he'd been talking about this is issue for over 10 years, well over, that in 1965, the age of consent here in the United States in the state of Delaware was seven. I know he's heard this. In, in 30 other states, it was 10 years old. I'm not justifying that. I'm just demonstrating the hypocrisy of, the, of it all. In his book, Opposing Hate Speech by Professor of Sociology, Anthony Joseph Cortez, he says that, uh, and I quote, in 1962, the American Law Institute recommended that the legal age of consent to sex, that is, the age below uh, which sex is defined as statutory rape, be dropped in every state to age 10. In fact, until the 1960s, the, uh, the legal age of consent in Delaware, what I just mentioned, was seven, so a 50-year-old man could have had sex with a seven-year-old boy or girl, end of quote. So note, again, the hypocrisy. The Christian world set the age of consent at seven, but David Wood is trying to con condemn the prophet, peace be upon him, uh, because of a hadith that say that Aisha was nine. But wait a minute, ladies and gentlemen of the court of logic and reason, uh, the Muslims disagree on the matter. So how in the world is David Wood uh, convinced that she was nine? Were you there, David? Uh, was anyone else there? Only two people were there, the prophet, peace be upon him, and Aisha, and only Allah knows when that marriage was consummated. No Muslim knows, let's face it. So the truth about Muhammad and Aisha by Miriam Sarah, she says, and I quote, 
Some modern, some modern Muslim scholars have more recently cast doubt on the veracity of the saying or hadith used to assert Aisha's young age. And taking all known accounts and records of Aisha's age at marriage, estimates of her age range from 9 to 19. And what does she say? Because of this, it's impossible to know with any certainty how old Aisha was. All Muslim scholars believe, again, that, uh, you know, the, the Quran is infallible. Miriam Sarah says, in Islam, the Hadith literature, the sayings of the Prophet, peace be upon him, is certainly, uh, is, excuse me, considered secondary to the Quran. While the Quran is considered the, to be the ver verbatim word of God, the Hadiths were transmitted over time through rigorous but not infallible methodology. And that doesn't mean that the Hadith are unreliable, but, but it's intellectually dishonest not to admit that there are hadith that, have, that contradict themselves regarding the, this, the, this marriage. And that's why Muslim scholars have varying opinions about what David Wood claims to be fact. But now consider this fact. When there are hadith that, that, that David Wood and his puppets of propaganda uh, think that they can use to attack Allah, Islam, the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, they talk about those hadith like they struck gold, you know, struck, found gold and struck oil by saying the, the sahih. But note that, you know, in their blatant indecency and hypocrisy, they reject hadith out of the same collections that talk about the Prophet, peace be upon him, making the night journey to uh, Jerusalem and to paradise and to uh, uh, the Prophet, peace be upon him, spl splitting the moon and so forth. They reject all that. It's hypocrisy. It's intellectual dishonesty. It's Islamophobic dishonesty without question. And again, you often find out more about the accuser than the one being accused. In my book, Consider Islam Disproving the Patriots of Propaganda, I mentioned the misinformation effect, which occurs when people are influenced by what they hear instead of having firsthand knowledge or facts about an event. And the issue is even more problematic when people pass off information repeatedly by word of mouth. And passing on information by word of mouth, mouth often results in loss of information, distorted information, and various versions being reported about an event, making the information partially or entirely unreliable. So now, look, let's look at the real facts about this issue. The conclusions formed uh, are about the dates of Aisha's uh, marriage in, to the Prophet, peace be upon him, and consummation, bear with me, are based on three theories, not what he said, the most widely defined uh, de defendant theory is that she was born in the fourth year after Muhammad, peace be upon him, began receiving revelation of the Quran in 613 CE. This is the most widely defended theory because it's the one that people like David used most to attack the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and other, it would otherwise be, uh, uh, you know, uh, unvolatile issue. So if, if, if this were true, it would mean that, that Aisha was five years old when Khadija died, radiallahu anha. It would mean that she was... Uh, engaged at nine years old and married, and 18 when the prophet died, peace be upon him. However, it would also mean that if Aisha, Aisha died at six, in 672 CE, then she was only 58, not 67, as most, most authorities report. So in my own studies, I found theories about her, her, her death and that ranged from 57 to 67. And this within itself places her birth and her age at marriage in question. And this is all based on, you know, he's, he's trying to, to latch on to a uh, hadith, uh, a narration from one individual who was in his, in, in his late age and it, it was believed that his, his memory was fading because he was in his old age. That's what the scholars say. So the second theory is that she was born four years before prophethood in 605 or 606 CE and that would mean that she would be four or five when prophethood began, 14 or 15 when Khadija died, 15 or 16 uh, at marriage, 19 or 18 or 19 or so when the, when the marriage was consummated, and 27 or 28 when the prophet, peace be upon him, died. And that would place her at 67 when she died, which is 67 is the most common uh, age that she, it states that she died in the Hadith. The third theory is that she was five years old, uh, five years younger than Fatima, rather, um, who said to have been born five years before the prophets uh, called a prophethood, peace be upon him, and therefore making uh, the year of Aisha's birth in the year of 6, 610 CE. And if that were true, then she would have been 9 when Khadija died, 10 at marriage, 12 in the year of Hijra, and 14 when married, tw uh, 22 when the prophet, peace be upon him, died, and 62 when she herself died. And I recommend a reading of a work by Hazrat, uh, called Hazrat Aisha by Rukaya Waris Maksud, Mulana um, Muhammad um, Farooq Khan. So, uh, which, who say in their article, they state, and I quote, Unfortunately, some traditionists and biographers hold their views by choosing to ignore several important pieces of information which contradict 
this opinion regarding her age at, at, uh, at nine years old when consummated. So it says, which indicate that at, at the time of her marriage to the prophet, Aisha was much older, indeed as, as much as 10 years older than generally claimed. The basic problem is that, he says, the basic problem is that historians and traditionists seem to have chosen not to do a little elementary mathematics. Many have reported statements that are supposed to be factual, which are in blatant contradiction to the notion that Aisha was... Uh, was six uh, in 620 CE. So now, now consider this. In 2009, there was an article published on an anti-Muslim, very well-known anti-Muslim website by a very well-known uh, antagonist of Islam. And uh, uh, how much time do I have left? Are you standing for that? Uh, yeah, good. Okay. Final okay, good. So it, yeah, this is my <coughs> final point here. So this person says, for the Western mind. Perhaps the most disturbing fact about, quote unquote, fact about uh, the founder of Islam is that he has had a sexual relationship with a nine year old girl. And because of this, it's become increasingly popular in some circles to refer to the Prophet of Islam as a pedophile. He says, This is, of course, extremely offensive to Muslims who view Muhammad as the ideal servant of God and the greatest example of what a man should strive to be. Now, no, saying for this, for the Western mind, is implying that the Westerners are somehow more civilized than those in the East. Uh, it's xenophobic, Islamophobic. He's talking about Muslims. And what fact is he talking about? The one based on authentic hadith that uh, have varying sources? And what circles, of, this is my final words, what circles call Muhammad a pedophile? David Wood circles. David Wood circles. And who wrote that article? David Wood wrote that article, 2009. And surely he should know by now that the Muslims themselves, and stop trying to disqualify the fact that the Muslims themselves disagree, and you don't get to choose. Thank you very much, Kenny, for your <laughs> opening statement. And with that, we are going to hand it back to David, Dr. Wood for your 10-minute rebuttal. All, All right, right, for anyone you. just tuning in, we're debating whether it's immoral for a man who's the pattern of conduct for billions of people to marry a girl who's young enough to be his granddaughter and to have sex with her when she's only nine years old. I'm arguing that Muhammad's marriage to Aisha was immoral. Kenny's arguing that Muhammad's marriage to Aisha wasn't immoral. Uh, in my opening statement, I showed that Aisha was indeed nine years old when Muhammad had sex with her. I presented what's called an even if, but in fact argument. Even if Aisha had reached puberty when Muhammad had sex with her, it was immoral because sex with young girls puts them at risk. Uh, but in fact, Aisha hadn't reached puberty, and so the relationship was especially heinous. How did Kenny respond? He says, I'm guilty of presentism for applying modern standards to Muhammad. And I agree, it's not always a good idea to apply our standards to other people around the world or to people down through the centuries. The problem here is that Muhammad is the pattern of conduct for Muslims in the present. And so the present is relevant. And uh, he's the pattern of conduct for Muslims in the United States. So it, it, this is all relevant for, for discussion here. He says, I'm trying to demonize all Muslims. I'm attacking all Muslims. Not at all. Most Muslims live far better lives than their prophet uh, ever lived. So hats off to them. Um, he says, uh, I didn't tell you that Aisha was happily married. And he says that Aisha could have spoken up if she'd been abused. Yeah, it was really safe to say <laughs> what a horrible person Muhammad was in that culture where you'd be killed for saying such a thing. Um, and by the way, Aisha said that she wanted a monogamous relationship, whereas uh, Muhammad had nine wives and not counting as slave girls. And so that was an ongoing uh, source of distress for her. Um, he says that Muslim scholars agree that there was no wrongdoing. <laughs> Why do they agree that there's no wrongdoing? Because you won't criticize Muhammad. If you did have a problem with it, you'd be ex-Muslims and you'd be, uh, you'd be endlessly ridiculed by Muslims. Um, I think Kenny said that we can't, yeah, we said that we can't prove her age. How many references did I give? Now notice, j just notice that. Uh, we'll talk about this more, but uh, Kenny, quoted a variety of sources. Who was he quoting? Gary Wills or something like that? Who was I quoting? Sahih al-Bukhari, Sahih Muslim, Sunan Abu Dawud, Sunan An-Nasai, Sunan Ibn Majah, the history of At-Tabri, Ibn Kathir. These are who I'm quoting. Who is he quoting? Gary Wills? Who? M modern, the, the encyclopedia of what? Is, is this how Islam works? The Islamophobes quote authentic Muslim sources, and then the opponents quote none. The defenders of Islam quote the encyclopedia of such and such. Interesting, interesting methodology going on here. Uh, so he quotes the uh, New World Encyclopedia and other sources saying that she may have been 12 to 14 or older. 
He quotes someone who says that Ibn Ishaq and Ibn Kathir and others say that she was in her late teens. This is very easy. It's very easy to show how this works. Ibn Ishaq, Ibn Ishaq page such and such, says she was 14. Give the reference. Give the reference. Ibn Kathir, on page such and such, says she was 14 or 16 or 18. What did Ibn Kathir say? I, re I literally read the reference. Ibn Kathir says there's no dispute, zero, no dispute at all on Muhammad having sex with Aisha when she was nine years old. Somehow, we get, a mystery, we get these mystery references where Aisha was much older. And it's very simple. Ibn Kathir, volume what, page what? It's very simple, very simple methodology. Uh, and who else did he quote? Leslie Hazelton, saying she was 19. Uh, he said he read all 10 books on the table and they all gave a different age for Aisha, so we just don't know how old she is. You can't convict someone of a crime when there's conflicting evidence. Well, if the conflicting evidence doesn't come until 14 centuries later, right? You, you, you wouldn't get off on a crime because 14 centuries later everyone started arguing about something because they were embarrassed by it, right? The, the, the Muslims did not uh, disagree on this in the second century, the third century, the fourth century, all the way down to the time of Ibn Kathir centuries later. No disagreement until then. The disagreements come from modern Muslims who are ashamed of their prophet because of what he did. Um, he said Muslim scholars disagree on their ages. Yeah, they, again, they disagree now. They didn't disagree in the second century uh, after Muhammad or the third century or so on. They disagree now because it's so embarrassing for them. Um, then Kenny said that a person in Islam can't marry until they've reached the age of puberty. Did we entirely miss the discussion of Surah 65, verse 4? Surah 65, verse 4, which gives divorce proceedings for divorcing a girl who's too young to have reached puberty after you've had sex with her. So let me go ahead and read this. Surah 65, verse 4, we'll read the beginning. And those of your women as have passed the, passed the age of monthly courses. For them, the idda, that's the waiting period after you divorce them, so in case they get married again. If you have doubts about their periods, it, their periods is three months. And for those who have no courses, no monthly period, for those who have no courses, i.e. they are still immature, their prescribed period is three months likewise. So girls who don't have a monthly menstrual cycle because they're immature, and in case you, you think I'm misinterpreting this, Tafsir of Ibn Kathir says this refers to the young who have not reached the years of menstruation. Tafsir Jalalain, one of the most popular commentaries of all time, says this means, and also for those who have not yet menstruated because of their young age, their period shall also be three months. Tafsir Ibn Abbas, Ibn Abbas, one of Muhammad's companions. He says that he gives the historical background here. Muhammad's giving these rules for divorce, upon which another man asked, O Messenger of Allah, what about the waiting period of those who do not have menstruation because they are too young? And then we have the answer in Surah 65, verse 4. Tafsir uh, of Maududi, modern Muslim scholar. He says, therefore, after discussing the issue, he says, therefore, making mention of the waiting period for the girls who have not yet menstruated clearly proves that it is not only permissible to give away the girl in marriage at this age, but it is also permissible for the husband to consummate marriage with her. Now, obviously, no Muslim has the right to forbid a thing which the Quran has held permissible. So not only does he say, yeah, that's the rule, he says no Muslim can, can forbid marrying and having sex with a prepubescent girl because you'd be contradicting Allah. We're standing in the presence, I mean, we're, we're sitting in the presence of greatness here. This is someone who gets to overrule Allah in the Quran and who knows what these verses mean greater than the greatest Islamic scholars of all time. The greatest Islamic commentators of all time, Ibn Abbas, Ibn Kathir, the two Jalals, they all agree. And yet, well, we've got Gary Wells, so, and the encyclopedia, the New World Encyclopedia. All right, so what else do we have? Um, <clears throat> he said, throughout history, puberty has been considered the age for marriage. Well, if puberty is considered the age for marriage, you can't use the bandwagon fallacy here because that would just condemn Islam because Muhammad had sex with Aisha when she was nine years old. And I, I quoted, I quoted Bukhari. I quoted Bukhari on Aisha not reaching puberty. We, we, can, we can go through more. She was allowed to continue playing with dolls. Why? Dolls were forbidden. Dolls were images. Dolls were forbidden. 
She was still playing with dolls when she was taken to Muhammad's house to consummate the marriage. Why was she allowed to play with dolls? We're told she hadn't reached puberty. She hadn't reached the age of accountability. So she was allowed to go ahead and continue playing with dolls. So if puberty is the age for marriage, then Allah and Muhammad stand condemned. Uh, Kenny said, lots of people down through history have married young girls. Uh, yes, and we can look back and, and uh, say, well, maybe they didn't know any better. Muhammad is the pattern of conduct for all time. The Quran, which says you can marry prepubescent girls, is the word of Allah. And so this is quite relevant today, right? We can look back at earlier generations and say, okay, they didn't know any better. I would expect Allah to know better. And if it's wrong to have sex with a prepubescent girl, then I would expect Allah to pick a better pattern of conduct. And uh, finally, <clears throat> Kenny uh, said, uh, this story is narrated by only one guy with a bad memory. And this is just, this is, this is common, and, and this happens from people recycling the, uh, the same articles, um, which are all filled with lies. And fortunately, we have Muslim scholars themselves who look at these horrible articles filled with misinformation. And we have Muslim scholars themselves who just say, this, this, is, this is complete nonsense, these are lies. So uh, Jabril Fouad Haddad responded to the same ridiculous story about this only coming from one narrator. He said, try more than 11 authorities from among the Tabi'in that reported it directly from Aisha, not counting the other major companions that reported the same, nor other major successors that reported it from other than Aisha. So what do we have? Oh, just one guy reported it and you can't trust him. What do we have from Muslims themselves? No, 11 different people who reported it directly from Aisha, and that's not counting the other companions who reported it from themselves. So 11 people reported directly from Aisha that she was nine years old when Muhammad consummated the marriage with her, and other people said it as well. And what do we got? I'm still looking for a reference. Aisha was 18. Which, which, which verse, I mean, which passage in, in Bukhari? Which passage in Muslim? Where in Ibn, where? Who says she was 16 or 18? Nowhere. People just make these things up and then they pass them all around. Thank you so very much, Dr. Wood, for your rebuttal. And we're now going to hand it over to Kenny for your 10-minute rebuttal. Right, thank you. So David Wood just proved my case for me because he admitted that there's disagreement amongst the Muslims on this topic. My objective to come here was to, to, to establish reasonable doubt. The Muslims themselves disagree with one another on the matter, and yes and do, they, they get heated sometimes, and they do refute one another in videos and write articles about this and about that. Thank you, David Wood. So if the Muslims themselves are in disagreement about it, thank you, David Wood, case closed. You've established reasonable doubt in the minds of honest and reasonable people. Thank you very much. But let, let's, 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 uh, let's take it a step further. Uh, uh, in, regards to, in, in regards to when a, a young lady gets her, her, her period, okay, so I'm not saying that this, I'm not arguing for the nine-year-old uh, position, or I'm not arguing for any age, because you know what? I look at it unbiasedly, and for one, I didn't only quote uh, Leslie Hazleton and, and all that. These books are written by Muslims right here. I, it's not only Gary Wills. The reason I, I read Muslim and non-Muslim sources is because I want to see what everybody's saying. I'm not, going, I'm not going to look at it, you know, through a biased window, a narrow Islamophobic window like he wants to look, look through. He wants everyone to look through that window. No, I want to know what the Muslims say, the non-Muslims say, what this person says. That way I, I personally can draw a conclusion because that's what we should do as human beings and not allow anyone to impede on what we think and what we're supposed to think. No, when I look at all these different dates, if, if, if you, you imagine you sat and you read all these different books about this issue, right? And you see all these different dates. What, what date could you, what are you going to just choose one? Right? Why? Why would we do that? He wants to choose one because he has an agenda. He wants to, to choose one because he's built a big name for, for himself and generated a huge income by attacking Islam. That's, that's what he's all about. That's what he does. And if, if, you know, for the decent Christians out there, James White and these, these guys that refute him and reject everything that he says because of the antagonism, it's constant. He never talks about the Bible on his, on his channel. So let's take it a step further. What do, what, in an article titled, at what, at what age do most girls get their first period? I'm going to read this for a purpose, a reason. 
um, by Stephanie uh, Beringer. Matter of fact, it was just published September 29, 2021. They state that puberty often begins around 11 years old, although anywhere between 8 and 14 is considered within the typical range. And in the United States, a child may get their first period at the, when they're 12. But it's not entirely unusual, they say, for the period to happen as young as 8 years old or as old as 16. Factors such as family, uh, family history, race, diet, environment, and weight all uh, are determine when a first period might occur. And so, so defining the word child, what do, they, what, what do they define the word child as? A person between birth and puberty, or a person who has not attained maturity or the age of legal majority. So in that some people, like the verses of, he's, of the Quran that he's trying to suggest that, uh, are telling people they can have a, sex with a, a prepubescent child. No, it doesn't say that. Matter of fact, these verses are in Surah An-Nisa, and this is a, the women. It doesn't say the, the Jariah. It says the Nisa, the women that you can divorce, and the, you know, all, so all those things. So again, uh, he, he is distorting the facts and distorting the truth because he has an agenda. And let's take it a step further because... Again, you often find out more about the accuser than the one being accused. And if someone's going to talk so adamantly, we need to know about, you know, let's look at the big picture and not just through a narrow window. John Gill's expose, uh, no, let me go to a Bing Dunn, uh, Old Testament commentaries on Ezekiel, the book of Ezekiel by Nancy Bowen. Now, I'm going here for a reason, and so he can try to disqualify it, but he knows that what he, the reason he even brings that up is because he knows that he's wrong on the issue. But they state um, that, uh, that the, the, the issue in, in the book of Ezekiel means that a baby girl at, uh, arrived at full-blown full womanhood at her sexual maturity as her breasts developed and her pubic hair sprouted. She was ripe for marriage. In addition to numerous Bible commentaries, uh, there are many scholarly opinions on the passage that, that refer to uh, this issue. A work titled Marriage as a Covenant, uh, a Biblical Law and Ethics by developed by Malachi, by Gordon uh, Hugenberger. He says that, uh, that the age of sexual Love in Ezekiel 16, 18 may suggest that women generally married soon after puberty. And the Song of Songs by uh, in Continental Commentary by uh, Othmar Kiel says that uh, names that the de development of the breast and the growth of pubic hair as signs of puberty regarding that verse when the girl became eligible for marriage. Uh, so another one, uh, the Hebrew narrative and poetry uh, by Dan Bergant and Dave Cotter says that uh, the mention of developed breast and, uh, and appearance of pubic hair were signs of puberty that signaled the woman's physical preparedness for marriage. Now, someone could, could look at this information based on what the doctors say, doc, Dr. Stephanie Beringer in that article, and, and say, okay, well, they're saying that here in the United States, a young lady could reach the age of puberty at, at, at eight years old, and that also the environment has something to do with it. He's trying to disqualify all that because he's bent on trying to demonize the prophet and thereby de demonize all Muslims who want to emulate the prophet. Okay, so, uh, but the thing is, again, we go back to the, the truth of the matter and that the Muslim scholar, the Muslims themselves are disputing on the issue. Again, they're disputing on the issue and David Wood doesn't get to decide for the Muslims which side is correct. The fact is, no one knows. No one knows they weren't there. None of us were there. David Wood wasn't there. But he wants to insist that, and talk about it as though he knows for sure. You know, mention this hadith and that hadith. Look, we can go back and forth. The scholars do that. The Muslim scholars themselves do that. And they come up to different conclusions. I mentioned that in my opening statement. Now, but let's take it a step further. Uh, in in, uh, in the, uh, a, a work titled The American Academic Scholar of Ju Judaism, uh, in the, uh, Jacob Nesser, in the Comparative Hermeneutics of Rabbinic, uh, Rabbinic Judaism, states that based on Numbers 31.3, that a girl three and one day years old is betrothed by intercourse. Now, I can mention numerous, numerous uh, authorities on this issue. Matter of fact, let me mention another one. So a history of the Messianic law of purities. The girl, three and one day old, is deemed capable of sexual relations. I don't agree with it, but that's what the Bible is saying. Okay? Now, David, he doesn't talk about the Bible very often at all, if never, matter of fact, but he, he, he believes Jesus, peace be upon him, is God, the same God of the Old Testament, of father's the son, and son is the father, and all that. And so, with that being said, Jesus said in, in, in uh, the book of Mark, I believe it is, Mark 5, 17, whatever it is, he says, he says, think not that I've come to abolish the law, I've come to confirm the law. So your own Bible, let, I mean, we've got to look at the big picture here. 
the, the, well, great. Well, the, the fact of the matter is, if you believe the, old, the new covenant was written by the same God, then inevitably Jesus, peace be upon him, is confirming what was revealed previously in the old covenant, which stated that a girl three years old in one day could, could have sexual intercourse and you know, uh, be married at three, three, three years old. Now, look at the hypocrisy, man. Look at, look at the deviancy. And you can't just disqualify and say, oh, you know, you're just saying, it, you know, it, it, what's good for the goose is good for the gander and, you know, <clears throat> the pot called the kettle, kettle black and all that nonsense. But listen, we have to look at the source of what this information is coming from. And the fact of the matter is, again, the Muslims themselves disagree. And David Wood does not get to decide simply because he has an agenda in his puppet show to demonize the prophet of Islam, and thereby demonize all Muslims. It's not going to work. You're not going to get away with it. Even, even professor, respected scholar, Jesus, uh, Jesus Vermes, he says in regards to uh, Numbers 31, uh, he says that, that we must remember that in the intertestamental, intertestamental and early rabbinic age, pre-puberty marriage was generally permitted. In fact, rabbis seriously debated whether bloodstains found after the wedding night in the nuptial, nuptial bread of a, a bed of a minor marked her first period or the consummation of the marriage. And so it's just a, the utter hypocrisy. And again, let, let, let me, let, let, in, in this court of logic and reason, let me introduce case number 2022, the people of the world versus Joseph. Okay, and this is the made up uh, case, obviously. But consider this, Mary and Joseph, uh, they, were, they were traveling together, they were married, they were traveling and living together uh, before Jesus, peace be upon him, was born. And we all believe, Muslims and Christians alike, believe that, the, that Mary, may Allah be pleased with her, was certainly a, a virgin, okay? We believe this. So that means that Mary and, and Joseph were traveling around for, for however long they were married before Jesus was born, and they were married, they were traveling together, living together, but the marriage hadn't been consummated. But he wants you to think that just because he wants to latch on to a hadith that, uh, uh, you know, hadith that state that she was nine years old, that other Muslim, you know, Muslims debate about, um, you know, and, and insist that the prophet, peace be upon him, you know, consummated the marriage when Aisha was nine, but... Is it not possible for the, the prophet, peace be upon him, to live with Aisha and have, have, you know, not consummate the marriage? Mary and Joseph did it. Why couldn't the prophet of Islam have done it? How, can you, how do you know you weren't there? But you keep repeating this nonsense over and over and over again. Tell us about, you know, the, the Jesus preached the gospel. We don't hear that. What we hear is hate mongering. We hear hate speech. We hear division. We, we hear a demonizing of the Prophet Sallallahu and thereby trying to demonize all Muslim men and victimize, make the Muslim women look like they're oppressed. That's what the agenda is, that she's defenseless. She's a, a great scholar of Islam. She could have said all kinds of things if she had been abused. We don't see signs of that anywhere. So I'll leave it at that. <clears throat> Penny for your rebuttal, and with that, we are going to go into 15 minutes of open conversation and dialogue. Gentlemen, the floor is yours. Uh, yes, Kenny, uh, you keep saying that I'm the one saying that the marriage was uh, consummated when Aisha was nine, and yet source after source after source that I quoted to you, so for instance, Sunan An-Nasai 3380, it was narrated that Aisha said the Messenger of Allah married me when I was six and consummated the marriage with me when I was nine and I used to play with dolls. Uh, you keep attributing this to me and I'm the one quoting Aisha. Now my question for you is, if Aisha was this wrong, why do you keep saying she's a great scholar? If I can't trust her on when Muhammad had intercourse with her and, oh, I, can't, I can't tell the difference between when I'm 19 and when I'm nine. Why should we believe her about anything? You see, you see what he's done again. So David Wood, what he's done again, he's gone to right back to the same, to Aisha. The, to the same, the same issue, right? <laughs> to Aisha. So, so, so right, back, Aisha. right back to, please don't interrupt me, but going right back to the same issue. Now, trying to disqualify the fact that what I've, the reason I put these books up here is to demonstrate that they all say a different age. All these modern books. They, these, 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 look, they all say a different age. They've studied the issue. 
They've written books on the issue. Where they did Aisha all say stay a different, a different age? age? Where did Aisha say a different They age? all say a different age based on what they have studied of the Hadith. Now, Where did any th of Muhammad's David, companions now David Wood, give a different age? David Wood, you're not a, a Muslim scholar. Right, but not, I mean, that's why I'm studied, quoting, that's why I'm quoting Muslim scholars. School. Ibn Kathir, so, Jalalain. But, but in this book, by example, it says that she was 11 years old. So when a reasonable person gets this book and gets another book and another book and another book and they all have different ages. What's the and reference? And they're, What's giving, the reference? they're giving sources. What's the reference Read in that the book? books. Sahih Bukhari. Read the books. Where? where? Just, okay. yeah, you, you can just tell Again, me. so Sahih Bukhari. Sahih Muslim. So Give do you agree in Sahih Bukhari? Let's, 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 yeah. Okay, great. So, okay, great. So, <clears throat> Sahih Bukhari. Mm -hmm. So you, do you agree that, uh, that the Prophet, peace be upon him, based on the Sahih collection, that he made the night journey to, to Jerusalem, Jerusalem and to, to paradise, and that he split the moon? Do you believe that? No. Okay, why? I believe that he claimed it, and I believe that's what they believed, okay. and that's why they recorded it. It doesn't, okay. it doesn't But they're mean... Sahih. But they're Sahih. You're... No, right. no, are they Sahih or not? Look, you're, you're but saying... No, but the, 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 Aisha the, says I'm nine years old, and you're saying, well, if I believe Aisha saying that she was nine years old when Muhammad had sex with her, therefore, I had to believe that Muhammad took a night journey to Jerusalem. It doesn't, it doesn't work okay, like that. So, Aisha but, says she was nine. Aisha says she was nine. That doesn't, believe, that doesn't mean I have to believe every ridiculous story that Muhammad came up with. Okay, so again, do, do, you, see, do you see the unbalanced scale here, right? So in the same Sahih collection... In the same Sahih collection, he wants to reject anything good about the Prophet of Islam. No, I, no, I, be, I believe those. Reject I, 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 anything I believe those good. stories. I believe those Re stories go back, but I, I believe Muhammad was a liar and making things up. Okay, so there original. we go. Are you saying so, Aisha so was hear, making things up? Aisha no, made no, up I'm her not saying age. Anything. She's I'm a liar. That these, She's these a great scholars. scholar. Why would Muhammad marry her? Yeah. yeah. So, so what I'm saying is that when I read on this issue, okay, I'm reading Muslim and non-Muslim scholars and historians on the issue. And the reason they're drawing their conclusions is because based on what they have seen and based on what this person says and that person says and breaking down the, the, the hadith mathematically, what the historical facts are on the issue, they've come to different conclusions, which tells anyone with a reasonable mind that there's reasonable doubt about being able to, if we were in a, 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 a literal court based on this information, we couldn't convict someone today. But in modern times, he wants to convict the prophet of something that he wasn't there right. about. It, he doesn't, he doesn't really know. Is it he doesn't really know. Am when I being the, the unreasonable for asking for one reference? I mean, I gave like twenty. Am I unreasonable for, for asking for one? If you're, if Aisha says over and over and over again, and eleven of the tabi'in report this directly from Aisha herself, and other Muhammad, other companions of Muhammad, state it. From their, own, from their own observations that she was nine, if this is what we have saying that Aisha was nine, and you're saying, well, maybe she was 11, maybe she was 13, maybe she was 18, maybe she was 19, is it too much to say, give me one single reference in anything remotely resembling an authentic Muslim source to show that. Okay, great. Instead, it's no, we'll go to the encyclopedia. We know no. that people disagree today. Why? Muslim scholars and apologists keep circulating these articles filled with lies, and then someone oh. like Gary Wills will come along and say, oh, Muslims don't okay, know he just when proved she, my case, Muslims my case don't again. know how old she was. There must be all this disagreement. Okay. okay. No. So there's he, zero disagreement. So for the second time, he's proved my case. He just said that Muslim scholars, they, Today, they yes, go in they circles do. and they say this. He's called them liars, but they have legitimate reasons for what they say. Uh, and not, not references, have, apparently. Sure. I, I've already mentioned what, the, what these people say in these articles and in these books. I've already mentioned that. Now, now, again, he's proving my case for me because he's now admitting again for the second time that the Muslims have disagreement. Now, he Today. wants to latch on to one side. And not consider the other side because it doesn't fit his agenda. And so what, a logical person has to look at all this information. And you cannot pick up 10 books and read through 10 books and get 10 different ages and say, this one's the one I'm going to go with. You can't do that. You cannot do that. I mean, not, not, if, you, not if you're a, a sincere person, unbiased, with no reason to, you know, uh, uh, you know to, to, to draw a... a Illogical conclusion, obviously. It would be illogical to say, all right, I've looked at these 10 books and I'm just going to, any, mini mini mom, I'm going to go with that one. Now, the, the, the hadiths that he's talking about, they were 
from what the scholars state, that they were narrated by someone by the name of Hisham in, when he migrated from Medina to Iraq. That's a lie. And, I'm telling you what this That's a lie. And by the way, you call me a liar. Who, who, you call the scholars a liar. You're not going to call saying, me a liar. I'm saying you read an article. No, well, and the you're article's not liar. But, uh, but you, not. you heard I read I read, the article, I read the article, right? Yeah, and I quoted okay, and, so and, you, I, and I showed this you. comes from 11, so, 11 different okay, well, and on. multiple other companions. No, no, it's, so, it's a lie. so so the who Muslim Hisham, scholars. By the way? Do you know who Hisham was? The Muslim scholars are stating, okay, that. Now, I'm not arguing, t keep in mind, I'm not arguing for one side or the other. Y'all don't know what I actually believe on the issue. Because the point is, I don't know what to believe on the issue. That's what I believe. Who is Hisham? I don't know tell what to, hold on. Tell I don't know what Hisham to believe was. on the issue because there's conflicting evidence, okay? And I'm not going to allow any Muslim to impede on my judgment. I'm not going to allow an Islamophobe to impede on my judgment. A person who approaches this unbiasedly has to say, I don't know what to believe because... Obviously, none of these people are talking about it. No historian, no scholar, Muslim or non-Muslim alike, people from Encyclopedia, Hazleton, uh, you know, no, none of these people were there. Matter of fact, the people narrating it in the same hadith that he's talking about, they weren't there. They're saying what someone else said. That Hashem is, is narrating from what his father told him. Mm -hmm. And who, who again, was his again let me father, make the, the point way? about who was his the fact. Hold on. I want to make the point about. Okay. Yeah, I don't need. It. Okay, Tell them so who Hashem's father was. so the, the point being is that Hashem is known historically to have had a compromised memory. Now this is what this is what I've read in multiple works. He had a compromised memory. He was in his seventies, and uh, that that caused the, the hadith to be in question. On top of that, it it only came from Iraqi sources. It only came from Iraqi sources, and the scholars have a problem with that because it says they say that it doesn't make sense. Okay, go ahead. Uh, yeah, who was who was Hisham? Do you know? Do you know who Hisham yeah, was? Yeah, who he was. T who? Tell us all about it. Who was he? Yeah, I know. How, he's the one that narrated those hadiths. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But 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 who was he? Yeah. Go ahead. You don't know. Yeah, I know. He was. Yeah, I do know. Who was he? he I mean, he was the grandson easy. of someone, right? <laughs> he no, was uh, the son of Zubair. Okay. And the grandson of who? He was that. He, what, what does that matter? Abu Bakr. Okay, okay, great. So, but what, what, but so what does Zubair, that matter? Zubair is Aisha's nephew. Hisham is his son. He gets the, he gets the hadith um, from his father, who is Aisha's nephew, who got everything from Aisha. Um, and that's just one sort. That's just one of 11. That's just one of 11 sources who recorded it from Aisha. So you've got Aisha. Guys, I... I if you have 11 different people all reporting the same story from Aisha and it's confirmed by multiple companions of Muhammad, if you don't know that, if you don't know that, if, if, you, if you can't say, if that's in dispute, if you say I've got 11 people all reporting the same exact story from the same exact girl, and that's, that's just no evidence because you know, you've got the, the encyclopedia, New World Encyclopedia or something on your side, then fine, don't tell me we know anything about these people. Okay, don't so, tell me we know anything. If I can't trust 11 witnesses plus a bunch of companions, we can't trust them. Don't tell me we know anything about your prophet. Okay. All we conclude is that there, were, there was mass lying and your sources are completely unreliable. Uh, I'm fine with that. But if we actually take your sources remotely seriously, Aisha was nine, Aisha was nine, 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 and we get down to the modern period, Muslims are embarrassed because this is a source of great criticism. Some make things up. And notice, that's what he, he's, he's, quoting, he's quoting someone who says this all comes from one source, Hisham. It's a total lie. Someone made that up, put it in an article. It's a lie. It's been exposed so, repeatedly. It's been exposed for years. Okay, he's repeating right. it. He didn't all even right. know who Hisham was. So, so someone made it up and put it in, are they li they're making up a lies and put it in an article. Yes, that's a total okay. lie. So, so everything about Islam, it, the Muslims are all lying. And the, no, you know, they're, I they're believe all, they're all making this up This is the amazing thing. The, the, I believe the source is more than okay, you do. Right, so they're, they're I have more confidence. They're, they're all manufacturing I, I have more respect for Aisha and Muhammad's companions. And Ibn, I have more respect for Aisha and Muhammad's companions and Ibn Kathir and Islam's greatest scholars. I have more respect for okay, them than so Muslim just, apologists. He's just going on and on and on. You, 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 you bumping your lip like that is not, not doing anything. So... Yeah. Okay. So thank you. And and so, again, uh, I mentioned a, an article by example. 
I mentioned an article. I didn't write the article. Published February 2019 by Sheikh Dr. Ridwan Ibn Salim. I'm going to read it again. Although widely cited hadith states that Aisha was nine years old when the marriage to the Prophet was consummated, this is contradicted by strong historical evidence. Reports of Aisha's age and works such as authorities such as Nawawi, Askalani, Ibn Kathir, all place her in her late teens at the time the marriage was consummated. Just give me one do you remember, of those. Hold on. You remember me saying that? Okay, so also, uh, uh, do you remember me saying that uh, an article posted um, last month, December 28, 2021, by Faisal Rahman, what does he say? As all biographers of the Prophet agree that he consummated his marriage with Aisha at the, at the year second Hijra, uh, it can be conclusively said that she was 19 at the time and not nine as alleged in the aforementioned hadith. So when you look at this evidence, now he wants to insist because he's, you know, he's been saying this lie over and over and over again for all this time. But the fact of the matter, he wants to demonize anything that Muslims say, that they're, they're lying, they're, 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 they're manufacturing these different stories and these different theories to try to make up for this and make up for that. No, the Muslims debate with themselves on the matter. And I'm repeat it again. Listen closely. The Muslims debate with themselves on the matter. Okay? And if they're ba debating with themselves on the matter, that means that there's no agreement on the issue. And what are we supposed to do with that? I'm not the scholar. Right? I I'm not the Hadith scholar. I'm not, I have, I'm not the one that came up with those issues or, or those studies. Yeah, Other yeah, Muslims have yeah, done that, yeah, you know and they've the, come to different conclusions. You know who the greatest Hadith scholar of all time is? Ibn Hajar al Asqalani. And He's guess the greatest what? Greatest Hadith scholar. And guess of what? I just time. mentioned that he mentions that Asqalani has has something that's, that what's competes the, what's with that. What's the reference? Issue. Because you but, know what Asqalani well, we go actually to, we said. Go Asqalani's the, the one who said since she was still playing with dolls, she hadn't reached puberty when she, when the marriage was consummated. I'm going to let me repeat this that's, one sentence. That's, <laughs> let me repeat one sentence. Yeah, you're going to repeat Reports, what someone else said. Give no, us no, the reference. That's fine. But what, but who does he mention? I actually quoted He mentions Nawawi. He mentions Asqalani. Ibn Kathir. Hey, look, I didn't do his study. And he's I didn't do his study. And he said Ibn Kathir. Ibn Ibn Kathir, the Muslim scholar who says there is no one Let's who disputes Muhammad consummating the marriage with Aisha when she was nine years old. Let me ask you I a question. I can give you the page number let me, let me, and the volume number. Right. Let me, Ibn let me Kathir, ask you a question, who David. indisputably says this, the same Ibn Kathir who says that Surah, 9, I mean Surah uh, 65 verse 4 let, let me ask means, you a question, David. is referring to prepubescent girls. The same Ibn Kathir, there's a mystery okay. reference. All right. let, me, let me ask you a question, It's all David. mystery references in Nawawi and al okay. Asqalani all right, great. and Ibn so, Kathir. We can't give any okay. actual reference, but they're there. Okay, Trust great. Us. So, it, so, okay. So, in my opening statement, I said I'm not here to debate this hadith versus that hadith, what that scholar says versus that scholar. I want to ask you a question, David. Be honest. Be honest. Do the Muslims disagree on the matter? Muslims today, yes. Muslims okay. back then, no. Okay. So the and Muslims you, today. So you're saying hold on, hold on. If he, he's, not, today, he's, he, he's not giving you right information. He's not giving you right information. <laughs> the Muslims today, they also mention that the Muslims back then, I'm, not, I'm talk, not talking about the Sahaba. I'm not talking about the companions of the Prophet. It wasn't an issue then. But, but scholars after that, they did indeed disagree. And he's proved my case for the third time. There's reason to doubt what he's saying. Because the, mis the Muslims themselves, they disagree on the matter. So you so, cannot, so every, 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 you cannot every, convict everyone someone. Take note. If you, you cannot have convict the someone. The unanimous like, testimony. Do this, yeah. Just let me. Just, okay. I'll, I'll right. just finish that. I'll just finish that little uh, two sentences. Okay. 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 So the methodology is: if the Quran, the Hadith, all the major collections, all the companions. Aisha herself, if everyone agrees, you can dismiss it and throw it all out the door if modern Muslims who are embarrassed about their prophet dispute. Good methodology. Gotta love Islam. <laughs> Closing statements before we jump into the Q&A, and thus I'm giving it right back over to you, Dr. David Wood. All right. <clears throat> I just want to say uh, at the end here that I know this is a sensitive subject, and so uh, whatever else happens, I do respect Kenny for agreeing to debate this topic and for being the one who suggested it, which is why it's kind of weird when he keeps telling me to talk, you know, why, don't you, why aren't you preaching the gospel? You suggested this topic, so I'm happy to address it. Um, <laughs> with, with that, that said, said, I, I haven't seen, seen anything, anything that, that would suggest that Aisha was anything other than nine years old, because... I have dozens of sources saying that she was nine years old. Uh, I have zero saying that she was 
14 or 18 or 19. Uh, all that we have in the world is uh, a bunch of modern people saying it after a bunch of articles filled with just outright lies, saying completely ridiculous things. Oh, this is only from one person. It's all lies. And then it gets circulated and people don't know any better. And they think it's better, it's better to lie about Muhammad in order to make Muslims feel better about their prophet, in order to block the criticisms of the Islamophobes than to tell the truth and be really embarrassed. Well, you can do that if you want, but to suggest that, that we then can just throw out all the Muslim sources when they give this unanimous consensus uh, is, I would say, just shameful. Uh, Surah 65, verse 4, again, of the Quran, allows sex with prepubescent girls. That's what it says. Ibn Kathir says that's what it means. The two Jalals say that's what it means. Ibn Abbas says that's what it means. Modern Muslim scholars like Maududi say that's what, it, that's what it means. Even Muhammad Hijab, he said, if you didn't know that Muhammad waited until Aisha was nine from the Hadith, you would think that Surah 65, verse 4, is allowing sex with five-year-olds. That's not me. Are these guys Islamophobes? Was Ibn Kathir an Islamophobe? Was Ibn Abbas, Muhammad's companion, an, an Islamophobe? Is, is Muhammad Hijab and, and Ali Dawah, are they Islamophobes? Are they bigots? Because when, when I say the exact same thing that Aisha says, I'm a bigot. When I say the exact same thing that Islam's greatest scholar said, I'm, a, I'm an Islamophobe. Very, very interesting stuff where if you simply repeat what Islam's greatest hadith collectors and so on have said, that makes you uh, some sort of uh, horrible, horrible, horrible person. Uh, now, Kenny did commit a variety of fallacies, and I, I can't tell if he was just making mistakes or if he was uh, being deliberate, uh, but he would, he would quote the Talmud, for instance, and he would say, you see, the Bible says three years old plus one day. Where does the Bible say that? We've got a lot of people read the Bible in here. You remember, you remember the Bible saying three years old plus one day and you can have sex with a girl? Anyone remember that? Right, it's not in there. Why are you attributing it? Why are you saying it's the Bible? Why? Why are you saying things like that? Um, and so then, apart from that, he gave some defenses of d different people down through history saying that, yeah, you could have sex with a girl after she reaches puberty. Once again, that is not the safest thing, but we can look back and say people didn't know that it's better to wait a little longer than puberty. It's better to wait a little longer because you still have a lot of danger associated um, because right when you reach puberty, it still takes a while for you to grow and so on. Maybe they didn't know better. But even granting that, you've condemned Allah and you've condemned Muhammad. Muhammad had sex with Aisha when she was prepubescent. That's not according to me. That's not according to me. That's according to Islam's most trusted sources. The Quran itself, Surah 65, verse 4. And not to mention, um, not to mention all of the, uh, <clears throat> not to mention all the commentaries agree that you can have sex with a prepubescent girl and let me, let me just close out with this. This is the title. This is the title of the chapter in Sahih al-Bukhari that includes Sahih al-Bukhari 5133. The title of the chapter in Sahih al-Bukhari, considered Islam's most trusted source on stories about Muhammad, the title of the chapter is Giving One's Young Children in Marriage is Permissible. Giving One's Young Children in Marriage is Permissible. And look, look at what he says. He says, Giving One's Young Children in Marriage is Permissible by Virtue of the Statement of Allah and for those who have no monthly courses, i.e. they are still immature, that's Surah 65, verse 4, the idda for the girl before puberty is three months. He then quotes Sahih al-Bukhari 5133, which says that Muhammad consummated the marriage with Aisha when she was nine years old. This is Bukhari quoting the Quran to justify sex with a prepubescent girl. He specifically says before puberty, I'm a bigot for saying this, and even though we don't have a, a single reference for anything, for anything that, uh, that Kenny is saying, we can reject all of this and we're, we're left with this awkward situation where D. Wood, the Islamophobe, respects Aisha and Muhammad's companions far more than modern Muslim apologists and debaters. Thank you so very much for your closing statement. And with that, we're going to hand it off to Kenny for your up to four minute closing statement. So when I began, I asked you to approach what I had to say as if we walked into a courtroom of logic and reason. We're in modern times trying to convict a man uh, from the pe prophet, peace be upon him, you know, from the seventh century about something that uh, the, the Muslims themselves indeed do debate about. It's a fact of the matter. Three times now, David Wood has 
admitted that the Muslims themselves uh, disagree on the matter. Now he tried to belittle it by saying that the Muslims are lying. Well, that's typical David Wood nonsense. The fact of the matter is there's disagreement amongst the Muslims. The Muslims disagree. And a person who approaches this logically and unbiasedly, if you're listening to all this, you're, you're left not knowing what to believe. Because, again, I mentioned numerous articles as well as these books that I've mentioned, uh, authors and historians, Muslim and non-Muslim, who all come to the same conclusion, well, different conclusions about the age, but they all come to the same conclusion about the fact that the Prophet, peace be upon him, didn't commit no indecency. That's a fact, okay? But the difference that we have here is difference among, you know, uh, the, with the age. So when I mention Hazleton and Gary Wills and these people, I'm mentioning because they, they're not Muslims. They're looking at where, where, where are they getting their conclusions from? They're getting their conclusions from the fact that the Muslims have various opinions on the issue. And their conclusion based on that, with no dog in the fight, is that they don't know what to believe. No one can, it can't be confirmed either way because they, they're, they're in disagreement about it. And let's face it, the only way for any human being on this planet, from the time of the prophet, peace be upon him, until today, the only way they would know for sure when that marriage was consummated is if they were there as an eyewitness seeing it happen. The stuck for law, of course, that didn't happen. So it doesn't matter who spoke about it, what period of time, when. They weren't there. They don't know when the prophet engaged in sexual actions with his wives. Now, he wants you to, again, envision the greatest scholar of Islam, Aisha, radiallahu anha, as some little baby girl that was getting abused. But guess what? There's nothing in the hadith that mentioned any signs of her, you know, being sexually assaulted and, and, and so forth. Matter of fact, she fought adamantly for the prophet. She loved the prophet. She was indeed jealous of other wives. And he admitted that by saying that she, does she want to be monogamous? I don't see anywhere where she want to be monogamous. But the fact is she was indeed jealous of other wives, primarily Khadija, radiallahu anha. So the fact of the matter is she didn't have signs within her, her character. We don't see any of that in the Hadith where she's saying anything about any type of sexual abuse or that she's saying anything negative about the Prophet. Oh, no. On the contrary, she is an adamant uh, defender of the Prophet, peace be upon him, giving us details about his life. Now, if she had been abused, does, does a person who's sexually abused go about the rest of their life, years and years after the, their abuser uh, 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 molested them and, and Never mention it to anyone, and, and not only that, but go and defend the character of the prophet himself? A logical person can only come to the conclusion that there was no impropriety done. A logical person can only conclude that no one knows when this marriage was consummated. He's admitted it, and you know that's what I, I set out to establish, the fact that no one knows the date. Everyone's guessing. They're giving their best theories. No one was there. And that's reasonable doubt in the court of logic and reason. And so be it. He proved my case. Thank you. Thank you very much. I don't have to go to the Hadith to, to establish that fact. You did it for me. Thank you. Thank you both. Thank you both of our wonderful interlocutors. And now if you guys have any questions for one or both of them, if you can line up here. And our only request is that a question ends in a question mark. But we love all of you. Uh, Kenny. Yes, sir. Uh, how do you know that Muhammad split the moon? Were you there? And um, does that give us reason to doubt because we weren't there? So, yeah, well, thank you for your question. Uh, no, I wasn't there. And, um, but I have no reason to doubt uh, the statement. And the, the, the fact of the matter is I'm not a, a Hadith scholar, so I haven't studied the Hadith in, in detail. And... Uh, so, you know, if to, to me, uh, that such a question, to be honest, is it's irrelevant because it has no bearing on my, my belief in Islam. It has no belief in my my uh, belief about the prophet himself, peace be upon him. But again, that comes from the Sahih collections. And hey, look, uh, uh, are we going to put these things on, on the proper scales and say, OK, well, this came from the Sahih. This comes from the Sahih. What you know, it's, it's picking and choosing. No, I wasn't there, just like David Wood wasn't there when, when the, the marriage was consummated. And so, uh, you know, all I can do is, is say, to, and be honest and say, I don't know. Just like I'm saying in regards to the age of Aisha at the consummation, Radiolahu Anha, I don't know. 
I'm not afraid to tell any Muslims that or any non-Muslims that. I don't know. That's what an honest person says. And uh, with a person with no agenda, I don't know. And alhamdulillah, that's the truth. I have no problem with that. In speaking, if you were presented with convincing evidence that Aisha was nine and it was enough to, to convince you that that was the case, would you at that point... It, it, would you at that point see the prophet as doing something awful or would you change your view on statutory rape? Yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a great question and I appreciate that question and it's an honest, you know, it's an honest question. Now, I, I mentioned an article that was published just last month. Uh, Stephanie Beringer wrote it and they mentioned that here in the United States, by example, that it's not uncommon for a, a girl to uh, reach puberty at the age of eight years old. But there's a stipulation in Islam that they have to have reached the age of puberty, that's one thing. They have to also be mentally and emotionally uh, capable of, in, of, of engaging in the act. They have to be mature enough and emotionally you know, st stable enough in, uh, before any type of interaction like that can take place. So based on that, I believe that the prophet, peace be upon him, at whatever age she was, and I'm not conceding and saying I believe she was any particular age, I don't know. But the fact of the matter is I believe that the character of the prophet um, based on historians and you know, what, what, what uh, people who've studied his life unbiasedly, um, you know, um, you know I, I have no reason to think that he would uh, have uh, done anything, uh, you know, um, anything wrong in regards to that issue. I think he would have waited until she reached a, a proper age mentally, emotionally, and physically as well, so. Um, so, okay, is this, is that good? Okay, audio is good. Um, questions for uh, Kenny. Um, so you uh, talked uh, you talked a lot about a, um, some kind of epistemological questions here today about about who knows what and how can we know for sure about different matters and and you know you were you were saying that like you know uh, we don't know and you were saying that even um, Hashem you know he he was failing in memory so we don't know you know he he might not have remembered right but that was. In like within a generation, that was in the generation of the Tabi'in, you know, like right after uh, uh, the Prophet. So um, the thing is, is that like if, if they didn't know for sure, then then what to say of the scholars that, you know, about 1400 years later? Yeah, but but um, so what I'm going to what, I, what I, my question was is um, my, uh, I actually had kind of two kind of a dual question. Um, are you saying that those books you have sitting there on the table have the same authority as the Sahaba and the Tabi'in, no. and my perception of Islam has always been that uh, there is a, a strong chain of narrations. Maybe uh, if this, just to able to wrap up. Yeah, sorry. Um, there has always been a, a strong chain of narration, and when there is a strong, multiple strong chains of narration, then then Muslim scholars can have consensus about that, and Muslims can be confident about what to believe on religious matters. So are you saying that even when there's multiple strong chains of narration, we can't really know anything about religious matters in Islam? No, no, I'm not saying that at all. I haven't studied those chains of narration. What I've done is I've gone to sources, other scholars, historians, and read their opinions on these issues, and they've concluded that um, the, the ones who, who argue that, I don't know, I don't know what, how old she was, again, but the ones who argue that she was older, they, their reason for it is that Hashem, uh, they have a problem in the fact that none of those sources come from Medina, they all come from Iraq. And, um, you know, that's, that's the conclusion that they draw. And, they, and they, they usually go into, they have to go into multiple hadith to, to, to break it all down. We don't have time to go through all that today. And, but, but and I do have that information, but it's, it's too much to go into. It's too complicated. And because you have to do, you have to go, do math and you have to look at this date and that date. Um, and, you know, the, the fact of the matter is when you're, when you're doing all that speculating and you're, you're um, you know, uh, when you look at all the information, what I'm trying to tell the Muslims and the non-Muslims alike is that, you know, how, how can we say for sure? This doesn't mean to, to deny the reliability of the, of the hadith, but Allah says in the Quran not to go to extremes in your religion. And so we don't have to necessarily pick a side just because out of your tradition, that's what you've, been, you've believed. The fact of the matter is they have different opinions and they, they're building strong cases on each side for this age and that age and the multiple ages in between. That leaves a person like me that wants to look at it unbiasedly. I just want to know, I want to find the truth. Well, the truth that I've concluded is that 
I can't draw a conclusion because they, can't, they, they haven't drawn the conclusion. So it's, it's unfair to try to insist that she was this particular age when uh, it's like disqualifying everyone who says, no, well, let me, let me give you my reasoning for this. When it boils down to it, they're all giving their different theories. They're all speculating. And it leaves the person who's unbiased just trying to seek knowledge on the issue to say, uh, based on <laughs> what I've read, I can't, I can't say one way or another. And that's all I was trying to establish with this debate. That's why I'm not afraid of this debate. I don't, I, I'm not trying to impress any Muslims or non-Muslims. I'm trying to come and say, look, I'm not going to allow you to impede on my, my thoughts. And my thoughts tell me that based on this information, I couldn't draw a, a logical conclusion. None of us were there. And we must take in pace. Thank you. Thank you. So, um, okay, so this is, this, is, this is a question for David and also really, I mean, both. But um, I remember you mentioned a really good point, right? Like the Bible does have, um, the Bible does have a lot of immoral things in it, right? Like it does, there are some verses in the Bible that justifies pedophilia or like, um, yeah, all that, right? Um, whoa, 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 whoa. What are you talking about? It was 31, I mentioned it. There's nothing about pedophilia in there. <laughs> I just mentioned, I mentioned three yeah, or four different you mentioned, sources. You mentioned what someone said, and there's nothing. Okay, those in are fact, scholars. In fact, whoa, whoa, again, whoa, 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 whoa. The, in fact, the passage says the exact opposite. Those, of those are scholars that they've all drawn the same conclusion. Those are scholars. Just before we go back into the discussion. Yeah. But I was about to say also. like Sex also, with a prepubescent girl or even a minor is not mentioned at all in Numbers 31. So just to be clear. All right, go ahead. But I also agree with you, too, that like... Um, it is, I do believe that the whole relationship with Muhammad and the uh, little girl was immoral. But why can't y'all just, both of y'all admit that, yeah, the Bible has uh, said a lot of immoral things, the Quran has said a lot of immoral things, and um, that's just the things that happened in the past. It was different culture back then. Um, like, do you think it would be better to, like, approach it that way instead of saying, like, oh, yeah, like, my religion is not immoral and my, my religion is moral and, your religion is immoral. Um, if this were some random guy, right? If this were some random guy from the past, right? Like, like how many Christians do you know are, are, are using some twisted passage from scripture to say that right now we need to allow sex with prepubescent girls? I've never met one, unless it's like a, maybe a cult leader or something like that. <clears throat> How many Muslim scholars and apologists are saying that there's nothing wrong with having sex with a nine-year-old girl? A lot. Let me tell you, a lot. A lot. And so this isn't some, hey, you know, we have a dis you know, we, some guy in the past. I wouldn't care a lot if it was some, some random guy in the past. The guy that is the pattern of conduct for Muslims in the world today, even though there are plenty of Muslims who live far better lives than this and would never even think of doing this, the pattern of conduct, the pattern of conduct in Islam had sex with a nine-year-old girl. And because of that, because of that, modern Muslim scholars and apologists are defending it. But you have people like Ali Dawa. Again, he, I mean, this is one of the most popular Muslim da'is on the planet. Very, very popular. Hundreds of thousands of, of, of followers on YouTube. He's on video saying that if his daughter were to get her, her first menstrual cycle when she's nine, he'd tell, her he's, he'd tell her she's ready for marriage, right? So this is relevant to today. If you actually believe that it's wrong for grown men to have sex with nine-year-old girls, then this isn't something to ignore and say, well, let, you know, let's just say, hey, you know, let's agree to say that this is in the past. This is the present. This is the present because Muhammad is the pattern of conduct in the present this is relevant. If you have a problem with it, you got to. Can, can, I resp can I respond to it just briefly? Yeah. Just a, may, maybe a minute or so. I, I really just yeah. he had such a short Q and A. I hate to do it to you, but I have yeah. to say we got to. Okay. <clears throat> so, uh, Kenny, uh, I, 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 can, I can respect that you're trying to take some intellectual humility and in saying you don't know and saying you can only share your thoughts. You've said you have no agenda, no bias. So, given that you're sharing your thoughts, 
what do you think? At what age would it have been immoral for the marriage to have been consummated for you? If not nine, where do you draw the line? And and I know you've called David Wood uh, Islamophobic, that he's a puppet master with followers, nonsense. But you've repeatedly said that when these accusations are lodged, it tells us more about the accuser than the accused. So what do your accusations about David tell us about you? Okay, well, great. So the consistency of a man defines who he is. Now, now I say that in... A person like David Wood is going to try to define the prophet of Islam as a, you know, a warmonger and all the things that he says about him. Uh, he does this consistently. But however, uh, people who have studied his life unbiasedly, that have no agenda, that you know, look, at the, the, look at the information that's provided and you know, uh, uh, have no, no agenda uh, on the issue, they come to a totally different conclusion. And I can, matter of fact, I can bring up a list right now that, on, that I have, and I can go through and read about 30 different scholars and historians, well-known figures that have studied the, the life of the prophet, peace be upon them, and they have totally different conclusions than a person like David Wood. So again, a lie often repeated is a lie that becomes the truth in the, in the minds of some people. But the truth is the truth even if no one believes it. A lie is a lie even if everyone believes it. Or rather, or vice versa. Truth is the truth, even if no one believes it. A lie is a lie, even if no one believes it. So he's convinced himself, for whatever reason, uh, that the prophet, peace be upon him, was, uh, was a, a, a person uh, that was uh, not worthy of, of, of emulating, but... Uh, so what age do you go? Yeah, yeah. so... so, uh, uh, so the next question. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah. well... Uh, so you mentioned that the Quran doesn't talk about allowing child marriage, but David Wood read, read the verse and explained in the, the, from the tafsir. Can you please, that's what was my question, can you please go through the verse yeah. Yeah, we can go through and the verse. explain uh, why it doesn't? Uh, I don't know if we have time to go through the verse, but the verse is basically saying that uh, in regards to, it's, it's, it's addressing divorce, okay, and it's saying when you can divorce a woman. Now, it's talking about women in particular. The word jariya and you know, words for little girls and babies and so forth are not in there. It's addressing women in those verses. And who have not menstruated. But, yes. women, hold on, but women don't menstruate for many different reasons. Now, with that being said, remember the article that I read earlier? I read an article earlier that said, that was just published in November, that said that here in the United States that it's common for someone to, have, to reach their uh, a menstrual cycle at 12 or 14, but it could be anywhere from 8 years old to 16 years old. It could be it could be anywhere in between. So can, so so overall, in summarizing, in summarizing this, in that if if a person who is of an age where most people are are um, usually menstruating, uh, you know. It, it's still stipulation that she has to menstruate, but keep in mind, this verse is being mentioned as a, def, as, as a means to protect the women from being divorced while they're pregnant, being divorced while uh, she could be potentially pregnant and you don't know who the, the father is. It's every, those, those verses are specifically telling the Muslims don't just divorce these women and just put them out on the street. Even those ones who have not yet <clears throat> menstruated for whatever reason, it might just because they you know, their biological clock is, is, is off. It, there's, there's multiple reasons. He's trying to draw one, one conclusion, and it doesn't apply. Uh, Ibn Hisham, he married uh, Aisha in Mecca when she was a child of seven and lived, in, uh, lived with her in Medina when she was nine or ten. This is from uh, Sirah to Rasulullah. Um, this is Ibn Hisham, you said 14-year-old, but it actually says um, uh, nine or ten. So my question is, you know, like you quoted that from the, uh, the books that you have, like from the 21st century. So if, should we like, uh, first of all, you know, are you a Hadith rejecter? If not, why should we follow the uh, 21st century books that you have instead of the, the Tabian and the Sahabas who actually reported the true uh, message? Thank you. So, so what I've found is people who have studied these, these Hadith and they've come to a different conclusion. And so I'm not, like I said, I'm not here to dispute any hadith uh, or any scholar or historian. My point is one thing, to establish reasonable doubt. Because when they're, when they're giving um, a different you know, alternative, a different possibility, then a person with a logical mind, an unbiased mind, an honest mind will say, well, that, that makes sense as well. And so the only conclusion that we can draw is that they're guessing. They're just, theories are, are, are just guesses. And so we cannot 
draw a conclusion and say and draw, try to establish a fact but when, when people are, are, you know, have different theories on the issue. And that's the fact of the matter. They do have different, different issues. I encourage you to look up just 9 to 19, Aisha 9 to 19, and watch what all comes up. Okay, uh, you'll see clearly that what I've established here is a fact. The Muslims themselves disagree, and uh, I'm left in the middle saying, I don't know who to believe, but uh, it, it seems to me that n no one knows, and that's how, that's how I view it. Okay, we'll do the next one. Hey, it's a for David. Um, so we, I'm, pretty much the question today was, is it immoral if she was underage? Um, I don't really blame the people at the time because they kind of were going with the norm. I do blame Allah for allowing it. I want to, without checking through an unbiased lens, using that same uh, perspective, could we not say the same about the Bible, that God is immoral for sanctioning, uh, let's say sanctioning, <clears throat> sanctioning uh, slavery and stuff like that. We could turn that same argument we use against him to say to you that your God as well is immoral. Thank you. <clears throat> um, well, if, if, if you have a practice in the Bible, and God said, I don't recall God saying this is, a, it seems to me the Bible takes these things as realities and then limits them and limits them and, and eventually you get to honor all people, do unto others as you would have them do unto you, right? And that ultimately undermines slavery. Uh, but, but as to your question, if you, find, if you find something in the Bible, of course, why wouldn't you want to talk about it? Um, it's one thing if it's if it's something that is like limited, if it's something God did at some point, right? And it's something in the past. You still, you still raise the question, why did God do that? Why did God do that? We have to, we have, to have that discussion. If it's something where it's, it were, if it were something immoral, something bad, and it's something that's commanded to people and, and, and advocated in general so that here we are in the 21st century, and Christians are going around doing something immoral, of course you'd object to it. And what do we do? We would, we would, have, we would, have, a, we would have a debate about it, right? Um, so, yes, whether it's the Bible or it's the Quran, if you think there's something going on that is spreading dangerous practices, uh, of course, get, get, get someone who wants to defend it and someone who wants to expose it and get them together, and I have, I have no problem with that. And I don't think, I mean, I don't think the... That's, that, that's why we're having de debates like this. So, uh, yeah, and so, uh, yeah, the situation is Muhammad had sex with a nine-year-old girl, according to all of the sources. Matter of fact, book over, you got a book over there by, by, by uh, Jonathan, Jonathan Brown, and uh, he had an awesome clip where he was in a room full of uh, Muslims, and they said, what about the sources that say she was older than nine? And he just looks and goes, what sources? <laughs> So a uh, quick change of pace here. I was a completely different uh, person before I came to Christ as a Bible Savior. And according, if I'm not mistaken, please correct me if I'm wrong, uh, you do not need a change of heart in order to receive, or you don't even uh, need to have any salvation in order to uh, be a convert to uh, Islam. So my question to you is, why is that not necessary for a person to have a change of heart in order to have a divine connection with the creator of the universe. I'm not sure where you got that information from. Uh, Allah says in the Quran that he does not change the condition of a people until they choose to change the condition within themselves. Right. Right. So, right. so. Which God needs to change you. Yeah. So you have to. Christianity doesn't preach that at all. God okay. Rather than you change yourself. Well, I think right. the Bible says faith without works is dead, right? So you have right. to, you have to make effort and yeah. you have that to put forth. Saved, yeah. So, yeah. So that's after you're saved, but you still have to put forth effort. You have to decide. It, you know, to make that decision to believe what it is that you believe. So for Muslims, the decision is, and we're forgiven instantly when we say, Ashadu Allah ilaha illallah, Ashadu na Muhammad Rasulullah, which is, I bear witness there's no God other than Allah, and Muhammad is his final messenger. And so you have to, you know, eventually someone came to that conclusion based on, you know, what they've studied, what they've read, and, you know, the influence, uh, uh, you know, that... Uh, um, you know, for, for me personally, is when I read, just simply reading the Quran, I didn't grow up around a bunch of Muslims, not none. Matter of fact, only my partner that was in the music business back then, he was a, he was a member of the Nation of Islam. He wasn't even true Orthodox Muslim. But so just simply by reading the Quran, I made the decision that when it says this is the book of which there is no doubt, 
for those who are mindful of their Lord, who stay steadfast in prayer and who spend out of what we provided for them and on and on. This book was speaking to me and uh, I made the decision that I believe what, what I'm reading and I've been a Muslim for over 30 years. Thank you. Oh, one last question for the night. And I want to thank Mike Wellman, who has been a big sponsor tonight. He's asking the question, Kenny, you've mentioned that you are not sure what age Aisha was, but if she was actually nine or younger, would you agree that that was wrong? So, uh, I'm not going to answer a question that is is a it's a what's the there's a term for this in in the world of debate I can't slip in my mind right now, but I, I'm not going to answer answer a question like that because it's unnecessary. It has it, you know my opinion on the matter. Uh, I haven't really given my opinion one way or another. My objective was to come here and to establish the fact that David is, has admitted that. The Muslims disagree on the matter. Now, he's trying to belittle them even further by saying they're lying and they're trying to conjure up this. And try, try, you know, Dr. Jonathan Brown said this and said that. You know, no disrespect to Dr. Jonathan Brown or anyone else. But the fact of the matter is there are, I just mentioned some other Muslims that have written articles on the issue. They have difference of opinion. They don't agree with Dr. Jonathan Brown. I'm not saying that I don't agree with Dr. Jonathan Brown, but other Muslims do. They have written and studied extensively about the issue. And so when a person like me reads it, I'm not the scholar of Hadith. When I, when I hear what they're saying about it, the only conclusion that I can draw is that I don't know. I don't know. And uh, I have no problem with that personally. That's, that's honesty. Uh, and uh, the, you know, the, we weren't there. The people writing articles and David wasn't there. He's trying to convince people that she was nine years old. He wasn't there. He doesn't really know. Let's be, let's be real. He doesn't know. According to her, I do have to, I do, I do, just to be fair to Ken, I, I think that is the last question, so we do have to wrap up.